just to uh, really pay attention to the, the uh, stuff up there on the board, on the projector rather, uh, if you are handing it electronically for this class, I would really, I want to emphasize the following out, please do your assignment as a native Google document, don't import a Word document or a PDF afterwards and then just share that. We uh, can't comment very effectively on that. If you do it as a native Google document, you highlight the part that you've made a mistake and it comment right there at it. If it's just a Word document that you decide to share through Google Drive, we cannot comment on the specific location where the mistake is happening. And in fact, in the future, I won't, we won't be able to accept those sort of submissions. Uh, also, if you do it, uh, just, we're getting a lot of submissions electronically, so to help uh, organize it, uh, if you could just use that notation for your, for your document. And uh, just finally, uh, has everyone handed in assignments to you now? Because I will be going through it in the class, and I won't be accepting late uh, candidates afterwards. So um, also there's no no late no late uh, candidates for this assignment. So just once I go through here on the the some other administrative issues I'd like to just uh, draw your attention to are here on the website. Um, the course projects are now uh, starting. You have until Thursday to select a topic of interest to you. And uh, the way it works is it's whoever works in first gets in first. So uh, two or three people have already select, selected some unit operations that they'd be interested in looking at. Um, the idea is the following. You will be handed in a 10-page report with you and your group members. So you can do it with one other person in the class. There's no exceptions to that. It's two people max, not, not three people. Uh, two people max per project hand in a separation unit from one of those flow sheets. So there's about 70 different uh, project areas that have been identified all from previous years that students have worked on. Um, so you pick, pick that flow sheet, and there may be one unit operation that really stands out that interests you, and that's the unit operation that you and your group member will write a report on. The report is aimed to be looking at the design of that other unit's design and size appropriately. So you would pick reasonable flow rates, reasonable production volumes for a unit of that on that flow sheet and uh, and go with it. Very much like the beer example. So the beer example is an example report on the website there for that. Uh, pick, a, pick a certain flow rate, pick a certain problem that you're faced with in that industry and design a reasonable separation unit. The report is 10 pages, and then there will also be a very short five-minute class presentation, uh, maximum five minutes, and the material from that presentation will be in the exam. So you'll be teaching the rest of the class on some other units, and portions of the presentations will be used in the, in the final exam. This report is not going to be like a standard course report that tends to get happened in and be invited in December. You'll be handing this one in fairly early in November and uh, having the presentations fairly early as well. So, and the reason why I've done that is because I know in, in your other courses you tend to get loaded up at the end, so I've, I'm trying to bring this one forward for you. So just be aware that that's coming up very soon. Please select your project by Thursday, and then um, you'll, you'll submit an outline to me as well of what you'd like to look at. I'll give you a bit of feedback, and then uh, you'll hand in your final report sometime at the end. Any, any questions regarding that? There's no statement. Okay, so please, uh, to, to help coordinate that on the website, on the course website, there's a link that you can go to and you sit, just fill in your group members' names, group member one and two, pick your choice of the first choice unit operation that you'd like to look at. Uh, second choice and third choice you can also put in, and then write a justification for that first choice. The, I'm, the only reason why I'm using that justification is if there's a tie between two people picking the same units, I may look at the justification to help me make a decision of who gets one over the other. Um, but so, so put three choices but justify your first choice. Okay, so the other a uh, bit of feedback that I've been getting via the course website is uh, just to ask uh, to have a few more examples in the class and to uh, 
funnily enough, asked for equations, so if you want to see a bit more equations, a bit more work, uh, work through that. So what I thought today is instead of uh, run, uh, moving directly onto cyclones, I may get to that at the end of the class, is I'm going to spend uh, a few minutes first looking at the Lear example from last class, just to, just to uh, go through that concept of how to approach that. Then we'll look at one other example that was in the course slides, and then I'll in fact look at assignment two uh, and treat some of those questions here in the class today. If we get to cyclones by the end of the class, um, that's, that's great. If not, we'll pick up cyclones on Thursday. And then on Friday, uh, remember, we have a visit from uh, the guy from GE. He'll be coming to talk about membranes. He has said that he will show and make a membrane in the class for us here at the front. Um, and then he's just got some general overview of this. It's, it's a great industrial contact as well if you're into waste water treatment. OK, so let's, let's take a look at the example there from the last time. So the design requires you to build a unit that would separate yeast from beer and the density of the yeast cells is 1075 kilograms per meter cubed, the density of the beer is 1020. There's a very small difference of about uh, 55 kilograms per meter cubed. Now centrifuges rely on that density difference. That's the principle of centrifugal operations. Uh, as long as there's a density difference, we can create a separation between the two. And in this case, um, that, that's, that density difference exists, it's fairly substantial. Um, we'll see a case next here where the density difference is much smaller and we'll need a, lot, a, a, a much larger centrifuge to, to create that separation. We're given the, the cell diameter of the, of the particles, the yeast particles that we wish to separate, and then um, the volumetric flow rate. So we need to treat four times cube per day of, of this material. So the, the general approach for all these centrifuge problems is the following, is the key equation that we use is that volumetric flow rate is twice times the terminal settling velocity times the sigma factor. That's the core equation for, for, for centrifugal operations. And Q then is given in this problem, it's the desired volumetric flow rate that we wish to treat. And being a design problem, it's, it's, it's fairly open-ended. We don't need to design the unit to treat exactly 400 meters cubed per day. We had a bit of a discussion last class on maybe we should design this unit to treat, uh, maybe even double that. So we operate the unit only for 12 hours of the day rather than the full 24. Um, one of the other students suggested to maybe buy two centrifuges um, and, and run them alternating. So design two smaller centrifuges, and then you can have one offline and, uh, and operate the other one or clean it out or maintain it. So Q here is at the very at the very minimum you want to design to handle 400 meters cube per day. You probably want that to be much much higher. Um, in my case, I, I chose double the amount. So, or, or maybe in my report I didn't choose double the amount, but here on the board we can easily choose double the amount. So we can design Q to be 800 meters cube per day. and set that equal to twice the terminal setting velocity. So two times the terminal setting velocity. The terminal setting velocity here is just given by Stokes law. Let's see if we've got enough information to calculate that. Stokes law is the diameter of the particle times the density of the particle difference with the fluid around it times the gravitational force that we're going to subject this particle to. In this case, it's not the usual sedimentation g, it's the omega squared from that centrifugal force divided by 18 times the fluid density multiplied by sigma. Okay. We have the diameter of the particle, we have the densities, we have the centrifugal, uh, we don't have the uh, centrifugal force, uh, sorry, the omega squared, it's going to create the centrifugal force, but we do have mu. So, omega is the only unknown in this equation. And dp, again, being a design problem, at a minimum we need to design a unit that can, can separate about 4 micrometers to 6 micrometers. We had a bit of a discussion the last time. You go for the smaller diameter. If you can settle out the smaller diameter, you're going to get the larger diameter. 
You could also over design the unit by sizing it for three microns or two microns. Right? We never had a particle size distribution that's fixed. In this case, if, if we were fortunate and had a normally distributed particle size, we've got four microns at the lower bound, six microns at the upper bound. But there are still some tails. So you may as well design not for four microns, but you could go for even lower for three microns. And so you're oversizing the units to account for greater particle size. Especially done when you're purchasing a new unit, you never know what this unit might be repurposed for in the future. You may move to using a different yeast culture that has smaller, smaller diameters. And so uh, you, you'd want to, to slightly oversize the unit. So we know DP, we know those densities, we know the, uh, the, the uh, viscosity. The only two pieces of information we don't know are omega and sigma. So sigma is, we spoke last class, is a pure function of the geometry of the centrifuge. It's a function of the height and of the two radiuses. So sigma is, is going to be our design for the centrifuge, and then omega is how we choose to operate that centrifuge. Speed, the rotational speed at which we choose to operate it. So now we're just down to a pure design problem. We know what our target is over here to treat 800 meters cubed per day. We know all this other information. We're just left to find omega, r1, r2, and the height. So those are our four free parameters to, to settle that equation. Okay. And then, then it comes down to just putting that into a spreadsheet and sizing it. Uh, so what I've done then is use the equation for sigma, which I'm not going to write up there, it's, it's a messy equation. Um, but putting that in, into a spreadsheet, we looked at this a bit last class, um, I can calculate over there, that's my desired sigma that I'm looking for, and then I can solve iteratively by just specifying various values of Remember this was that uh, centrifuge with the disks, so I can specify the number of, of uh, disks n over here. I can specify the angle theta, the radius of the inner and outer cones, and then find what the corresponding calculated sigma is and ensure that it meets or exceeds the sigma that I'm looking for. Okay. So fairly, fairly straightforward, but recognize that this problem is being reduced to one now where I'm looking for four free parameters to try and, to try and solve my target. Okay, so that's, that's the thinking and the approach for design and sizing these units. Uh, interestingly enough, when you look at what industrial centrifuges come up to be, um, I, I put a link on a, on a, on a presentation on, that I found on the web that shows some nice photos of the interior of these centrifuges and, and the, the diameters, uh, sorry, the radiuses of the unit correspond quite similarly to, to these over here. So we know that we're in, in, in our ballpark figure for this. And then the final check we need to do is just check the solids percent. So that information was uh, given back up here. In the, in the original problem, we were told that there's 11 and a half metric tons of E suspended in each 100 meters cubed. So on a weight-weight basis, you can calculate what the percentage solids are and ensure that it meets, this, it, it falls within the range, the typical operating range is 0 to 15% solids that are treated by these centrifuges. And this came out to be uh, a number that was below that 15%. So it's a good, a good final check that you've got a reasonable design. Okay, so this is the sort of uh, way I'd like you to look at your projects. Um, Find a flow sheet that's of interest to you, some, some area that, that you really are passionate about. Look for a separation unit inside that flow sheet. There, there should be one. Most processes are, are very heavily separation based. And then pick the, the design um, throughput through that unit. So either you're picking the meters cubed per day or some relevant uh, metric that measures how that unit is used in, in practice. And then design and size that unit appropriately double checking that the sizing matches somewhat what a, a vendor, a standard vendor in this area would be selling. So a, a vendor in the centrifugal area would be GEA. GEA is a standard a company that provides these units to aseptic, um, for aseptic operation of pharmaceuticals and bio separations and food manufacturing. Look at GEA's website then in this example and make sure that your centrifuge that you've specified or in your case whatever unit you've picked matches that, that's typical for, for that area. Any, any questions on 
on this approach. We're going to see a lot of these design questions come up, of more open-ended questions. I think uh, it's probably a little bit frustrating for you initially. You're probably more used to equations that you can just put in numbers and, and get an answer to. We're going to see, like you saw in the second assignment, question four, more open-ended questions. That's standard, and it's going to be standard for the rest of your career. And certainly for the courses I teach, that's, that's more of the approach I take. So here's one that's then more straightforward. You, you put in the numbers and, and, and go with it. Um, but there's also some interesting interpretation. Let's take a look at this, this question. And I'll give you a few minutes to solve it yourself, and then we'll look at it together. Here we're working in a laboratory scale. Um, we have a, a tubular ball centrifuge. So this is not the disc ball centrifuge we looked at earlier. This is the standard tubular ball centrifuge we started off this section with. Here we've got those vertical walls of water. And the inner radius is 16.5 millimeters. Phenomenally small. Right? That's the other thing I want you to look at is look at these numbers and, and visualize them. So very small inner radius, 16 millimeters, and then your outer radius, no more than two centimeters. So it's a very tiny tubular bolt centrifuge. Definitely treating a very small amount of, of material here. The bolt height, 11 and a half centimeters. And it's going incredibly fast, 800 revolutions per second. So that's not revolutions per minute, that's revolutions per second. So we've, we've created a very small quantity of fermentation broth in our lab with some bacteria suspended in it, and we'd like to separate that out. So this is in the notes here from last time. You shouldn't have to be writing this down. If that broth has the following properties, that the fluid density is uh, 1,010 kilograms per meter cubed, the viscosity is that of water, the particle size, notice how incredibly small it is, 0.7 times 10 to the minus 6 meters, so 0.7 microns. And then the particle's density is only 30 kilograms per meter cube greater than the water that it's suspended in. Very, very small density difference there. What we're interested in is to calculate for this lab scale centrifuge, if we had to operate that lab scale centrifuge 24 hours a day, what would be the volumetric flow rate we could treat through that very, very tiny unit? So calculated meters cubed per day. Now, remember, we, we calculated two uh, volumetric flow rates in the, in the, in the derivations of centrifuges. So let's just quickly recap that before you get started here. So my tubular bolt centrifuge, I have my central axis, and then I have a vertical wall of water. That radius R1, and then the total radius of the of the, of the tubular ball is R2. And we calculated the trajectory that a particle entering right here at R1 would take for a given height h. So my liquid height is h. And that particle, the worst case is a particle entering right there at, at R1 and traveling in a parabolic manner and reaching R2 at a height h. So we derive then the critical flow rate that we can operate at. This is when integrating the so Qmax is. Integrating from R1 to R2 and from 0 to H. So it's the particle's trajectory as we go from R1 to R2 and in terms of the height when we go from 0 to H. We calculated the time that it would take and from that time we can back calculate the volumetric flow rate since we know the volume that's contained in the century. said, well, that's not quite realistic. Uh, that's, that's really an excessive design. That volumetric flow rate is going to be quite small. So if we design instead for a, a different particle's trajectory, starting at R1, but then landing up at the midpoint over there, and we call this Q-cut. 
So Q cut is when integrating Now we're going from R1 to the midpoint, but we're still going from 0 to H. Okay, so it's clear that if, we're, if, that's, if this Q cut, if we we're going to target Q cut, Q cut must be a greater throughput than max. We can operate the centrifuge at higher throughputs of material passing through if we're only aiming for this midpoint over here. If this is our aim for a particle, we can operate at higher throughputs for the same given particle diameter than if we're just aiming for that corner point over there. So the, the equations for Q-cut and Q-max are in your notes. Let's just calculate Q-max. So I'll give you a few minutes. Calculate Q-max. Uh, there's a few subtleties here. You're going to have to deal with some unit changes and so on. So let's, let's do take a, a few minutes to do that and we'll uh, we'll continue on with the rest of the question.
that's the equation that we derived. And substituting those numbers in there, you're going to get, um, let's just take a look at, if, well, let's fill them in here. So dp is 0.7 times 10 to the minus 6. I'm just going to work in SI units. Um, the density difference is 1040 minus 1010, so that's 30. Omega squared is, which, what's the value for omega? 5,026, yeah. So 5,026, did everyone get that? 5,026, so convert your revolutions per second to revolutions per minute and then use that relationship that there's 9.55 RPMs per radians per second. So we need omega in radians per second. That's, that's key here. So uh, this equation is, is, is an SI unit. So omega in radians per second, not in revolutions per minute, not in revolutions per second. Revolution is not an SI unit. So radians per second is where you need to get that. So make sure we can convert 800 revolutions per second to get to 5,026 radians per second divided by 18 times the viscosity of water times the log of the ratio between the diameters. So you can, here you can change your units or not. It doesn't matter too much. So 22.2 divided by 16.5. And then the rest of that. So I'm not going to fill that in. Substituting that, it's a bit of a mess, but you can calculate that the first term is 0.0695. This remaining term here, the volume is pi r squared minus r1 squared times the height is uh, 7.97 times 10 to the minus 5. That's meters, meters cubed. So very, very small volume of the tubular volume which uh, makes absolute sense given the geometry. So that corresponds to 5.54 times 10 to the minus 6 meters cubed per second, or the incredibly small amount of 0 0.479 meters cubed per day. So less than half a meter cubed per day is what you'd be able to treat with a very small centrifuge. Now, if you follow those same equations, but for Q-cut this time, Q-cut has a slightly different term here in the denominator. It's not the log of the ratio of the single radius anymore. Slightly different term, and if you repeat the calculations, you can show that Q-cut is 1.034 meters cubed per day. So just by using the fact that we're integrating through different limits on where that particle lands up, we get slightly more than double the volumetric flow rate you can treat through that centrifuge. It's not exactly double, um, but it's, it's just over that. Then the final part of this question asks to calculate the sigma factor. So the idea here is, is, is that we're going to go sigma based on the cut. So calculate the sigma factor for the centrifuge based on the cut size flow rate, so Q cut. Sigma cut is, is given as, well let's just write the general equation up here, that Q is equal to 2 times the terminal setting velocity times sigma. So if we're using Q cut over here, we would call this sigma cut. If we were using Q max, we'd be calling this sigma max. The purpose is that we want to try and find the, 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 uh, the cross-sectional area that the centrifuge is effectively treating if it were a sedimentation basin. So given the flow rate, given the terminal setting velocity, we can calculate the equivalent sigma. So Q cut, uh, given Q cut is that, not meters cubed today, we can calculate sigma cut is equal to Q cut divided by two times the terminal setting velocity. So then we just need the terminal setting velocity. We know Q-cut already from the previous question. Terminal setting velocity, just use Stokes' law. 
So I'm going to just write it up here that it's a standard substitution into Stokes law. The terminal saving velocity in this case would be 6.92 times 10 to the minus 4 meters per day.
exceeding the, the requirement that we put any solids over into the overflow. So what were some of the options that people came up with? to the flow rate, to uh, volumetric flow rate that you can treat through there. Okay. Okay. And that's less kind of like a parabolic You got a parabolic shape, yeah. In fact, you'll find that uh, the settling velocity of going to Stokes law is going to be, depending on the region that you're in, is, is 1 over mu f. If you're in Stokes region, um, I should write here this proportional to, if you're in the intermediate region, region between 1 and 1,000, it's going to be proportional to the root of that. And if you're at higher than 1,000 meters cubed, B is going to have no effect. It's going to have no effect if you heat up the liquid. So you get diminishing returns. As you heat up the liquid and you get higher and higher setting velocity, you're going to go to higher Reynolds numbers, and eventually the velocity has no effect anymore. Okay, so, so this is an interesting one to look at. 
it's very much a, a function of where you already are on that uh, Reynolds number scale. Is what the, the heat and fluid detectors can have. <coughs> Any other options? Braden, do you have one? Is it a simple? Yeah. Uh, downstream centrifuge. Uh, downstream centrifuge. So now, now you're, you're thinking of um, adding additional units on in, in, in series. So we're going to try and look at this a bit later on in the course. We're not just designing independent thickeners. We're not just designing cyclones and uh, centrifuges. We're going to look at very shortly is flow sheets of these units and integrating them. So what's going to happen if I put, put them in parallel? What if I have a recycle from the underflow of my centrifuge back up as the feed to my thickener? Okay. So then it becomes a lot more interesting. Okay, then the final question for just from what I've seen and heard, I, 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 this question presented some challenges to people. Um, the <laughs> the, the main insight here in this unit is to, to recognize that if I have a container and I'm trying to be cheap and use this to settle up uh, dust for my airstream, I've got my airstream coming in assuming that it's, it's dissipated, um, the energy from that is not stirring up all the <coughs> material inside the vessel, then leaving over here again. So I've got a certain volumetric flow rate Q coming in. If I call that dimension L, capital L and we call this dimension capital H and then I call the depth of my container for the width of it W. I'm asking which one of those containers do I pick? One of those standard containers. So what did, did people pick a container and then calculate or did you calculate and then pick a container? The question is did say find the depth pick a container. But if you're picking a container, do you go small or large? Large to pick one of the containers that have open sides. <laughs> okay, yeah, definitely open <laughs> sides, sure. Um, but there, there is, there, would, which do you expect would have a better, uh, would work better for you? Intuitively, you think the larger container would work better for you because you're putting the same volumetric, if given, a, given a volumetric flow rate of fluid coming in, a larger container, this fluid now spreads out and, and moves then at a slower velocity and you'll be able to settle out um, and that would imply that you could treat a larger particle size. And that, that, is, that is, we can show that in the equations. The key point to, to understand is that the particle would settle at a straight line in this, in this case. Um, this is same as in the notes for the ideal rectangular sedimentation basin. So we've got a, 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 a vertical velocity given by the terminal settling velocity. We've got a horizontal component as well. The horizontal component is given by the volume divided by the cross-sectional area. So A, the cross-sectional area then is the width times the height. Okay. And what you want is you want your horizontal velocity So what we assume is, uh, if we look at the ideal, the ideal uh, separator has 
this inlet and then you assume that it all dissipates and spreads out, which for air would probably be a very good, a good approximation. You've got this, this pipe coming in and it, it's going to immediately spread out and then that velocity, if it's plug flow, is going to move in that horizontal direction. What you want is, you want this vertical terminal settling velocity to be faster than the horizontal velocity. So the particle, oh sorry, I, I wouldn't say the velocity, you want the distance traveled in the vertical direction for it to meet the bottom before it re meets, meets the side at the, up, at the opposite end. Okay? So you want that distance traveled, so the distance traveled is VTSB, the terminal setting velocity times height capital uh, divided by height capital H. So that's the distance traveled in the vertical direction to be. Wait a second. I'm confusing myself here. You want it to. You want the time taken. So <coughs> meters per second divided by meters is going to be per second. But you want H. There you go. The distance traveled divided by the velocity is the time taken. That time needs to be shorter than the distance traveled by the vertical velocity. The vertical velocity is the length divided by V horizontal. I know L, I know H from a given container. I know the terminal settling velocity from the, the, um, from the, from the particle properties. Um, the only thing I don't actually know in VTSB is to calculate that I need dp. Okay? And the only thing I don't know here to calculate the vertical horizontal, uh, the horizontal velocity is q. So there are my two unknowns in those two terms in that equation. So VTSV, just to just to be clear here, is the particle diameter squared times the density of the particle moves the fluid times g divided by 18 times mu f. Okay, and v horizontal is, is given up here. I'll we'll just write that again. It's q divided by w times h. Now, what I'm just going to do for you here is just take this away. One thing, the key point I want to emphasize is that if we have that relationship and I substitute, substitute in h divided by the terminal settling velocity needs to be smaller than the length divided by the, vertical, the horizontal velocity is q divided by wh. So let's bring w and h into the, into the numerator. So LWH is simply the volume of that cubic container. The interesting thing here is that my H is cancelled. And that's, that's, that's really, really what we want to see. From theory we know, we learned that from these rectangular basins, the height of that basin has absolutely no effect on the design of the unit. And here we're seeing that. I could pick a container that's this tall or the height of the room, it would make absolutely no difference. And that's so counterintuitive, but we're seeing it over there in the theory. The difference is the smaller you do the height of your container, obviously to maintain that flow rate through it, the volumetric plug flow velocity, obviously you're going to need a much bigger container to, to still balance out the velocities. But that's really, really cool to see that those heights cancel out. Yeah. How come height factors into the cycle and equation? Sorry? How come the height factors into the cycle and equation, but not this? The, the centrifuge? Yeah. Because they're, they're there to constrain by the volume, volumetric throughput. The H comes in as a as, Yeah. As, you have to multiply by the volume. I'll, I'll double check. To me, that makes sense because the volumetric 